Well, good morning. It's good to see this good number here today. We're glad that you're here with us and uh, glad that you're uh, uh, able to worship with us today. We're going to study from God's Word today and uh, a lesson that I think is uh, important. And then we're going to, at the end of this lesson, give you the opportunity to, to obey the gospel of Christ, if that's your need, because you believe that Jesus is God's Son. You want to serve Him instead of self, then this morning you can confess your faith before this number and be baptized or immersed in water to have your sins washed away and to be a child of His. Or maybe as a child of God, you've not lived in a way that you know you should. Uh, by leaving undone things you should have been doing or doing things you should not, and you realize it's time to repent of those things and ask Him to forgive you, we hope that's the decision that you'll make here in just a few moments. We're going to study, though, a lesson uh, that will hopefully inspire us to want to commit our lives to serving God, but also in a very specific way that we'll be committed to doing the things that He would have us to do. You know, you think about the world in which we live today, and all the controversy, and all the problems, and all the, the, the uncertainty for sure that is in our country today. You know, we're in the middle of a political season in which we're trying to decide uh, who will be the next president of this country, and whichever, you know, one of these two candidates winds up as being our president, and this is certainly not a political speech or the, the time for it, but whichever one of those would be the ones that would be uh, our president in the future, certainly we could say that we would at least have some concerns with, and that causes us problems, and we don't know what to think about maybe or, or to do. We look around and see the headlines where the scene that's on the, the screen above me has become far too often a, a scene that we see on our television screens where our police and protesters are lined up across from one another and we, we think about the uncertainty of so many situations and uh, the unrest that's in our country and we wonder what it is that can be done to solve those problems. We think about our, our current leadership in Washington and, and our president and some of the, the things that he's tried to enact, especially here uh, towards the end of his time as our president. Some of those things being things that are not in keeping with the, the things that we see in God's Word. And even our Supreme Court, some of those things they've overturned, some of those things they've backed wholeheartedly. And there are things that now are coming down the pipe towards us. And we wonder as we look into the future what, what kind of future we have held before us. We look at the legislature in Washington and we see that our Congress is passing rules and laws that we're going to have to live by, many of which are not in keeping with the truths that are found in God's Word. Our legislature on a state level in Nashville, some of those things that have come down from Washington, they've stood up to and said we're not going to do that. Some of them have been pushed right back to us. Some of the things that our state uh, leaders have come up with have not been in accordance with God's Word. And we look at that as Christians and we say, you know, what, what's going to happen? Even in the church, we see uncertainty in many places. Or we see elderships that are trying to, many of them, make the best decisions that they can to lead God's people in an appropriate way, that they're trying to shepherd the flock because of their love for the brethren and for the Lord. And then we see in other places where there are elderships that are, are trying to rule with an iron fist. They're lording over the Lord's body, and that's not uh, in keeping what Scripture says. We have preachers and youth ministers, some of which that are, are trying to teach the whole counsel of God and trying to do so in truth and in love and are trying to help the church grow. And then we have some that are just simply trying to grow their reputation and grow their names and trying to do the things that would make them to look good. And we look and we see good and bad leaderships in the church and we think, you know, what, what holds for the future of the church? Even in our homes, we see leadership problems sometimes with husbands who don't want to be the head of the household spiritually, much less many times physically or morally. And we see sometimes that, that wives and husbands clash over ideas, and, and there's so much uncertainty in the world today, not knowing which is the proper direction to lead the home. Many times the children are caught in the middle of that situation. Sometimes as mamas and daddies, we don't make the best decisions for our children, and we're very selfish in the things that we do, and thinking only ourselves. Sometimes it's our children that don't want to really be a part of the family. And, and, don't, and so even in the home, there's problems sometimes and uncertainty and unrest. And when we think about all of these situations, we think, what can we do? 
And where's the leadership that is needed? In the home, and in the government, and in the church many times. Well, when you think about unrest, and you think about uncertainty, we've really got it made when we compare our lives to Daniel, don't we? I mean, Daniel was someone that, that from his days living in, in the promised land, being carried off into captivity, all the regime change that he faced in his life. You know, Daniel lived to be an old man, especially by those time standards. And every time a new king or a new dictator would rise to power, there would be new rules, there would be new regulations, there would be new preferences, there would be all sorts of things he would have to get used to. And as a, a slave, as someone who is in bondage, as someone who's a refugee from another country after being overtaken by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, think about all the things he would have faced in his life and all the uncertainty that he faced. And yet every time we see Daniel, we see him doing two things. Number one, we see him being faithful to God. But even more than that, when we think of Daniel, usually we think about Daniel as a man of prayer. And that's the, the idea that we want to talk about today, is great leaders pray. Now, you're probably thinking, well, that's fine. I'm not a leader, so I can kind of check out on this lesson, right? It's been said by people who study such things that every one of us influence at least three people in our life. In other words, at any given time, there are three people. Maybe you don't know who they are. Maybe you do know who they are. But there's at least three people that are looking at you for leadership. Maybe it's people in your home. Or maybe it's people at work. Or maybe it's people in the community. Some of, of the members of this congregation are, are civic and government leaders. Some of the members of this congregation are business leaders. Some of the members of this congregation are, are leaders in the community and civic organizations. Some of the members of this congregation are leaders in the home. Your husbands and wives and mamas and daddies. Some of you are leaders in your school and, and sports teams and the FFA and 4-H and your classrooms maybe. Some of you are teachers and naturally are leaders because of that. All of us, to some degree, fall into this category as a leader. So what's the best thing we can do as a leader? It's pray. And in the life of Daniel, we see that. You know, it's an awesome responsibility that leaders take on. Because they're saying that I'm not only responsible for myself, but I'm responsible for all those who would follow me. And you say, I don't want that. It's too bad. The only way to avoid it is to go live on an island where no one else is. Charles Barkley famously said, I'm not a role model. Yes, he was. The, the question is, are we a good role model or a poor role model? Are we a good leader or a bad leader? We would do well to recognize Daniel, who was such a great leader, even in the positions sometimes of destitute that he was in, and do well to pay attention to this great man of prayer, and especially for our consideration today, Daniel chapter 9, verses 4, 9, 4 through 19, and see the, the four areas in which Daniel prays about himself and about his, his people. And as we do so, let's examine our own prayer life and see the kinds of things that we need to be praying for ourselves and for those who would follow us and for the leaders of our country and our state and our world and our community and everyone else that's involved in relation to our lives. First of all, as you're following the outline there in your uh, bulletin, the first thing that we noticed that Daniel prayed for is he recognized, he acknowledged God's greatness. He acknowledged God's greatness. Notice verse 4. It says, And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him and with those who keep His commandments. He begins by, by saying that he prayed and he made confession. Now, the reason that, that led uh, Daniel to this prayer, if you read the first three verses of Daniel chapter 9, Daniel has been going through and he's studying and, and he's looking at the, the prophets and the law. He's, he's counting the calendar days and he's noticing some things. He's noticing the fact that God said, we're going to be in captivity for 70 years. And guess what? 
It's been 70 years. So I'm going to go to God and pray. And the first thing, he, as he prays, he says, he conf- what's Daniel confessing here? Well, what he's confessing is that he's a mere man. And he knows that. Both physically and, uh, or excuse me, both personally rather, and as a nation. He knows that, that they're just men. And in comparison to God's greatness, he's nothing. The only way that we can truly be great, the only way you can ever truly be great is to first be humble. There are so many that, that want to take leadership roles because I want to re- people to recognize who I am. I want to stand out. I want to be a big shot. I want to be somebody important. But the best leaders are servant leaders, right? The best leaders are the ones that are humble, that don't think more highly of themselves than they should. And that's Daniel. The only way that a man can lead God's people, certainly, is to be a man who knows humility. It's important that we remember that God is in control. That's what he says. God, you are great and you are awesome because you keep your covenant. You show mercy. To who? To those who love you and to those who keep your commandments. That's what makes God great. Is that we can trust in Him. In the uncertainty of life, with all that may be going on in the political world, with all that may be going on in the, in the news media, with all that may be going on outside the walls of this building, there's one constant that we always know. We can count on our great God. How awesome is God, he says. So the first thing that he acknowledges is God's greatness. The second thing that Daniel recognizes or acknowledges in this great prayer is sin. Notice what he says here beginning in verse 5 and going down through verse 11. He says, We have sinned and committed iniquity. We've done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Now, notice what he said there. He said, We have sinned. We have done wickedly. And and you're going to see him continue to say, We and us, all through this prayer. That's the mark of a great leader, isn't it? You know, a great leader doesn't, doesn't try to push the blame onto somebody else. That was the leadership style of Adam. This woman that you gave me, right? That was the leadership of Saul. Well, you know, the people said they wanted to take these, right? A great leader accepts responsibility. Daniel says we. We saw that as we look into Ezra and Nehemiah as well. Verse 6, he says, Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our fathers and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of our land. We didn't listen. We had bad leadership from the top down. We were corrupt. You, know, you think about all, all 20 of the kings of the northern kingdom were evil. Most of the ones from the southern king, kingdom were evil. And that's the problem that, that led to where the, the situation they were in was sin. Verse 7, he says, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, But to us, shame of face, as it is to this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off and all the countries to whom you've driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. There's a little bit of shift here in the prayer. He he, he glorifies God for a little bit and then he he jumps right back. Oh Lord, you're righteous, but we're not. We've sinned. All these countries that we've been driven to, you know, the the Assyrians and the Babylonians, when they would take people captive, all of them didn't get brought back to Assyria and Babylon. They they dispersed them among all of the countries that they they had overtaken. They kind of mixed everybody up together. And the reason they did that was because they didn't want anyone to be united enough that they could stage an overthrow of their government, see? We've been brought to all these other countries that are not our countries. We've been brought out of the promised land that we wanted for so long that you gave to us. We've been shamed because of our sin. Verse 10, he says, tribes of north and some, or excuse me, verse 8 rather, says, O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Even though our fathers did this, he says, we compounded the problem because we kept right on sinning. And we're ashamed that we continued down that path. Verse 9 and 10, 
To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we've rebelled against Him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in His laws, which He set before us by His servants, the prophets. He continues to repeat over and over, right? We sinned. We sinned. We sinned. Lots of repetition in Scripture, isn't there? That's because that's the way we learn, is repetition, 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 right? And then verse 11, he says, Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse of the oath written in the law of Moses and the servant of God has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. The curse is the 70 years of captivity. And, and it's because of what was said in the law of Moses, right? God said, if you'll be my people, I'll be your God. But then he said, if you leave me, God said, I will leave you. See, the problem wasn't that, that God hadn't kept His word. The problem is that God did keep His word, right? We sinned. And because of that, God left. As far as we can tell, as much as He might say, we and we and us and us, it wasn't Daniel that had done these things. Daniel had been faithful. In fact, he had been faithful to the point that he had risked his own life, right? But he includes himself when he says we, as he refers to the sins and rebellions of the people. See, a good leader holds himself accountable, and he prays for those under him. If we're going to be good leaders in our homes, in the church, in the world today, we've got to be folks of prayer. We've got to be those who would pray, acknowledging the greatness of God, but then acknowledging our sin. And then thirdly, we need to be those who would acknowledge that the fact of God's Word and the importance of God's Word and the surety of God's Word. And that's what Daniel does in verses 12 through 15. It says, And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and judged, and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster for under the whole heaven such has never been done as what's been done to Jerusalem. Nothing like this has ever happened before. It was the end of the temple of Solomon. It was the end of worshiping God in Jerusalem the way we had been doing since we came into Jerusalem. It was the end of this great relationship with God. God kept His Word because we didn't follow His Word. He told us what to do. He sent warning after... How many prophets did God send the people? I'm begging you, repent. I'm begging you, repent. But they didn't listen. Verse 13, it says, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we've not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. If you go to the book of Ezekiel, and we're not for time's sake, but if you go to the book of Ezekiel, you'll see the people over and over complaining God, you didn't really mean 70 years, did you? And God keeps sending the prophets to them saying, what part of 70 years don't you understand? Right? This is what's going to happen. And I've told you it was what's going to happen. And here you are. You've brought it upon yourself. That's what he's saying here. God kept his word. We didn't listen. We didn't listen to his word. And that was the problem. Verse 14, Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which He does, though we've not obeyed His voice. All this calamity that He's brought on us, see? You know, we think about the world in which we live today, how much money and how much time and how much, how much uh, influence is spent trying to negate God's Word. Have you ever thought about that? Have you thought about how much not only from the outside, but even within God's people. How much time is spent trying to get around what God's Word says? We talked about in class this morning that unget aroundable. It's unget aroundable. But how much time do we try to do so? In verse 15, he says, And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the Lord, the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. You made yourself a name as it is this day. We've sinned and we've done wickedly. He goes back to this original idea of slavery and bondage that they came out of Egypt from. 
and we put ourselves back in the same situation. And the reason why we're in this predicament is our own sins. Because we didn't listen to your word. The problem was never that you didn't tell us. You told us, but we didn't listen. How many problems in our world today? And how many problems within the church today would go away if we would just listen to what God's Word says? It's really that simple, isn't it? Now, we complicate it a lot. But if we just listen to what God's Word said, wouldn't it be a better place? Wouldn't the church be better off? Wouldn't our homes be better off? For a good leader, we're going to pray acknowledging God's greatness, our sin, God's Word, and then fourth, God's forgiveness. That's the fourth thing that Daniel acknowledges in verses 16 through 19. He says, O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are reproached to all those around us. What he's really praying is that God might once again be glorified through the nation of Israel. See, Daniel understood that the, the way that God must be glorified is through His people. He got that. Do we get that? Do we? Do we get that the way God is glorified is through His church? Not, not through any country, not through any government, not through any organization. The church is how God is glorified. Daniel said, let us be your people again so we can bring honor and glory to you, but only you can restore that right relationship. In verse 17, he says, Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your faith to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. He brings it back to God. He says, All I want is for you to be glorified. And the only way we can do that is if you forgive us. The only way we can do that is if you restore that relationship with us. Verse 18, O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercy. And that works in with the idea of salvation, doesn't it? We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We only have it because of your mercy. We rely on you. And then in verse 19, he says, O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Look at the pleas here. How much he's begging God. What an awesome prayer. It's time that we begin begging God, isn't it? To see our relationship with Him as it really stands. And begging. See, Daniel understood that righteousness and grace and blessing could only come from God. That this relationship could only be restored because of Him. That true greatness was only possible if God blessed the things that they were involved in. Do we get that? You know, a great leader is one that's a man of prayer. And Daniel was. Daniel serves as a great example in so many aspects of leadership. But certainly when it comes to our prayer life. Daniel was one that prayed for himself, but he prayed for those who he influenced. And when we today, as leaders in our schools, as leaders in our homes, as leaders in our places of business, as leaders in our communities, as leaders in this country, in the world, when we start praying prayers that we're, we're recognizing and acknowledging God's greatness, when we're acknowledging our sin and our failings, when we start to acknowledge God's Word in the rightful place that it should have in our lives, we recognize God's forgiveness is what we really need. Then we'll have the kind of influence that we need. You know, in verse 4, I mentioned in class a few moments ago, but in, in verse 4 of, of 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 
where Gordon read for us a few moments ago, he says ultimately what God's goal is is for all men to be saved. Is that our goal? Is that what we're most concerned about? Are we concerned more about our pocketbooks, our parties, our, our well-being, our, our infrastructure? Are we concerned about souls? Are we thinking souls? That's what a, the kind of leadership that we need. That's the kind of leadership that our homes need. That's the kind of leadership that our churches need. That's the kind of leadership that this world needs. Is leaders who will put God first, who are thinking about the souls of others. We ought to be grateful for the leaders that we have in this congregation, the men that serve as our shepherds, and that kind of leadership that they bring us. And we ought to follow that leadership and be the kind of people and the influence that we should be in this community. Great leaders pray. You know, sometimes we'll say, because the situation is so bad with someone, maybe they've lost a loved one, or, or maybe it's some chronic sickness they're dealing with, or, or maybe they're going through some really difficult circumstance, and, and we'll say, well, I'll be praying for you. That's the least I can do, right? I think Daniel would say, that's the most you can do for somebody. Maybe by saying it's the least we can do gives an indication sometimes of what we think about God's power or His activity in our lives. But Daniel understood that the best thing he could do as a leader, the best thing that he could do for those who he influenced was to pray. And that's what we can do as well. This morning, if, if you find that you're not in a right relationship with God to be able to call on Him in the way that Daniel did, we hope right now is when you'll make those steps to correct it. If you're someone outside of Christ, that you'll put on Christ in baptism right now. If you're someone who's walked away from Christ, that you'll come back to your first love. Be the kind of leader and set the example that you should by showing those in this room and those that are in your life that your first love is the Lord. By coming right now while we stand and while we sing.